Last time, we talked about a number of monuments that were connected to one another geographically and also chronologically, and were also made out of the same material, concrete faced with opus incertum. I remind you of three of those today, of the uh, sanctuary of Jupiter Anxer at Terracina, of the sanctuary of Hercules Victor at Tivoli in the center, and then on the right, the sanctuary of Fortuna Primigenia at Palestrina. We're going to do something entirely different today. We're going to look at a single city, one city, in all its aspects, its public and private architecture, its civic, commercial, and religious buildings. We can't do this sort of thing very often. Uh, because too few Roman cities are either well preserved enough or well, execute, uh, well excavated enough to allow such an overview. <coughs> but this is no ordinary city. This is a very special city. The city we will be concentrating <coughs> on today is Pompeii. Pompeii was located in an area of Italy called Campania. It was located near Naples. It was located near the Mediterranean Sea. It was a small resort town in the late first century BC and into the uh, early uh, and into the uh, first century AD. And you can see it on this map here, and it's it's uh, uh, it's right here. Uh, you can see that this area of Campania is obviously south of Rome. It is along again the Mediterranean Sea. And you can see Pompeii here also with its sister city of Herculaneum and some of the other well-known cities from this area, Boscoreale, Aplontis, for example, and Naples itself, ancient Neapolis. Uh, and you can see this cluster of these cities that make up Campania. This was an area, I mean, this, the town itself, again, was a small resort town. It was a town that obviously had its own population of people who made their money largely from commerce because they were located so close to the sea. But it was also a spot that was highly favored by the glitterati of Rome, who used to come down to this area of Rome, not only to, to go to Pompeii itself, but to establish villas, to build villas in the vicinity of Pompeii. And we have imperial villas at places like Aplontis and at a place <coughs> called Bosco Trecase that is located here as well. Uh, and along what is now the Amalfi Coast and on the island of Capri. Uh, so this was a town, again, that was, was noticed and was visited even by the most elite in the city of Rome, in, in, in Rome itself, in the, city, in the center, in the capital city of Rome itself. But what's very important for us from the outset is to recognize that although Pompeii, as we know it today, was essentially a Roman city, it had a history that was much longer than that, that went back much further than that. And I'd like to go over some of the major highlights of the history of Pompeii because they will situate us and will help us to understand the city's architecture. The history of Pompeii, as I noted, is much longer uh, than the history of Roman Pompeii. It goes back as far as Rome itself. It goes back to the 8th century BC, the same Iron Age period when Romulus was founding the city of Rome. Pompeii goes back that far as well. It was first overseen by an Italic tribe called the Oscans, but the Oscans were soon taken over by an even more powerful tribe called the Samnites. And the Samnites are, in fact, extremely important for the city of Pompeii and for the architecture that we'll review today. The Samnite period in Pompeii lasted from the 4th through the 3rd and even into the 2nd centuries BC uh, up to 80 BC because it was in uh, 89 that Pompeii fell to <coughs> Rome. We've talked about Rome colonizing. Uh, this particular part of Italy, not only the area right around it, but the area south of it. Uh, and Pompeii fell to Rome uh, in an important military campaign in 89 BC. And in 80 BC, Sulla made Pompeii a Roman colony. What happened thereafter was the Samnites, who had built homes for themselves in public buildings that we'll study here, uh, the Samnites were essentially uh, thrown out of their homes. Their property was confiscated, 
And that property was given instead to the Roman veterans. We've talked about the fact that that was the way the Romans operated. They paid back uh, their veterans for loyal service by giving them land, and they usually gave them land of those that they had conquered. So that happens here as well. Samnite property confiscated, and the Roman veterans settle in their homes and begin to redo them, settle into using their public buildings, but begin to remake them in the Roman image. The next century and a half saw the construction of Pompeii's most famous buildings. But we should not forget, and we'll concentrate in part on that today, that some of these buildings had their genesis under the Samnites. During this period, there was a very high civilization in Pompeii. Uh, there was trade with Greek cities, and especially with the Greek city of Neapolis, Neapolis being the ancient name for Naples, for Naples. The next very important year in the history of Pompeii was the year A.D. 62, when the city was literally, the city of Pompeii was literally shaken to its foundations by a very significant earthquake, a very significant earthquake indeed. And to give you some sense of that earthquake, I show you uh, a, a frieze that, that encircles a shrine uh, that was located in the house, or that was commissioned for the house uh, as decoration and as a place to place the household gods that the owner and his family worshipped. The shrine had a frieze around it. The man himself, by the way, was named Lucius Caecilius Eucundus, and we're very lucky he didn't remember his name, but Lucius Caecilius Eucundus, and Eucundus uh, fortunately, we have a portrait preserved of Eucundus, so we can get a good sense of what he looked like literally warts and all, because you can see that he had a huge wart on the lower uh, left side of his face, and he was willing uh, to have himself memorialized, and here we are sitting and looking at him today in this classroom in New Haven, as he really was with this large wart on the lower left side of his face. Uh, but a wonderful portrait of Eucundus, uh, the owner of this particular house, who was obviously so struck and probably so affected in his own life by the earthquake. Uh, that he decided to, uh, to have a relief commissioned that would depict the event uh, of 62 AD. And you see exactly, you see what is happening here. You can see, in fact, the great temple of Jupiter, the Capitolium of Pompeii, which we'll talk about today, literally uh, collapsing. Uh, and you can see that in front of that temple were two tall bases with equestrian statues <coughs> honoring important people of the city. Those look also like they are uh, shaking in their boots, so to speak, and about to fall over. Uh, if you look down here, you see the city wall and note your uh, ashlar masonry, uh, your opus quadratum, and the use of headers and stretchers in this wall the wall of the city of Pompeii, but you can see the gate is not doing too well. It is also uh, seems to be tottering and about to fall down. So uh, this is a, a, a graphic uh, depiction of what happened then, and you can, it gives you some sense of, of the significance of this for the people of Pompeii. Now at the end of this, like in so many natural disasters, obviously these people loved living where they did. It's a beautiful part of the world. And they essentially stood up and dusted themselves off and began to remake their city, to restore their city uh, to what it was. And we have, uh, from this point on, from 62 on, almost immediately, 17 years of frenzied building activity in which the Pompeians try to bring their city back uh, from the dead, so to speak, uh, to bring it back to what it had once been. But you know the punchline here. You know the end of the story. You know that all of this work, all of this 17 years of hard work, was all for naught because on that fateful day of August 24th uh, in 79 AD, uh, the long dormant volcano of Vesuvius, which you see looming up behind the Temple of Jupiter in Pompeii today, uh, the long dormant volcano of Vesuvius erupted covering the city of Pompeii and all of its sister cities in a mass of, uh, or in a blanket of, uh, of uh, ash and lava. Covering it forever, well, not quite forever, almost forever, uh, because as you also know, the city was rediscovered in the 18th century. 
And when it was rediscovered, uh, what happened there first was a period of uh, treasure hunting. Uh, Well-to-do individuals, primarily from Europe, uh, made a beeline for Pompeii once it was rediscovered and began to, uh, to build their own personal collections of art uh, from what lay around. They took jewelry, they took metal items, precious metal items. They even did, did the unspeakable by cutting portrait paintings and other paintings out of the walls uh, and taking them back to decorate their own palaces and villas in other parts of the world. That went on for a while, but fortunately not too long. The archaeologists gained the upper hand, and we begin to see not long after that uh, a period of scientific excavation. And I show you two images here which show that scientific excavation, which show some of the houses of Pompeii being revealed uh, by archaeologists. Uh, and of course, it was all of the, the, the good work that they have done, and work continues apace at Pompeii. Excavation still goes on in parts of the city that have allowed most of the city, as far as we can tell, to be uh, revealed to us, to us today. Now, this tragedy that befell Pompeii in, in August of 79 was indeed a tragedy for them, for the people who lived there, obviously. It was also a tragedy for the reigning emperor, a man by the name of Titus, T-I-T-U-S, who who's the uh, honored and the famous Arch of Titus in Rome. We'll talk about him and his architecture in Rome later in the semester. Uh, but it was a disaster for him, and he had to contend with a plague and a fire in Rome also at the same time. Uh, it was very difficult for him, and poor man, even though he was quite young, died of natural causes after only three years in office. And I think it was in part this, this, this catastrophe that had happened uh, in the Bay of Naples area uh, that led in part um, to his, to the stress of it led in part to his demise. So this was a great tragedy for him, a great tragedy for the people of Pompeii, a great tragedy for Rome. But it, it, it was a stroke of good luck for archaeologists and, in a sense, for us as well. Uh, because, of course, what happened to, to Pompeii is something very different than what, ha than what happened to Rome. What happened to Pompeii is that it was, its life was snuffed out all at once. It came to an end all at once. Compare this to Rome, which has been inhabited over millennia. In Rome, buildings have been redone, rethought, remade. Uh, over time. That never happened in Pompeii because Pompeii again died essentially on, in August of 79 and everything that was there uh, was preserved just as it was and that's how it was discovered when it was, re when it was excavated in the mid 18th century as it had been, exactly how, how, it has, how it had been on that day in August in 79. This is extremely important. It's one of our only really fixed chronological dates uh, and it provides us with an incredible laboratory of material because, again, everything, nothing is changed, you know, from the time uh, that it was left there, except for what the treasure hunters <laughs> removed. But for the most part, nothing has changed, and we can study it as it was. The other thing that you must remember from the outset, that although what was revealed by excavators uh, in the 18th century, 19th century, and beyond even today, uh, was not just the, I mean, it was the Pompeii of, of August 79, but the buildings that stood there were not just the buildings that had been renovated between the earthquake of 62 and the eruption of Vesuvius of 79, but some of the very earliest buildings, including the Samnite structures, uh, still stood. And so when we look back, we will be able to trace, in a sense, uh, the city of Pompeii and its architecture from the time of the Samnites up until the time of the Emperor Titus. I want to begin with a plan of the city of Pompeii, and you see it here. And the plan that I show you is a plan of the city as it was in A.D. 79. Uh, we see all of the buildings at that juncture. We see that the shape of the city is essentially an irregular rectangle. Uh, and we also can see very well that the city is surrounded by a wall, a protective wall, as were, so it was walled like all the other cities that we've talked about thus far this term. Uh, you can see some of the major buildings very clearly, the amphitheater that we'll talk about today, the theater and the music hall over here. You can see the streets of the city, uh, the Cardo or North-South Street and the Decumanus or East 
west street of the city, as well as the re fairly regular blocks where the houses and the shops were located. What is important to note, however, is that the Samnite city was obviously much smaller than the city of 79. And to recapture a sense of the Samnite city, we have to look at the bottom left side of this plan, where we see the original Samnite city, which seems to have been roughly a fairly regular square. And in that Samnite city, uh, the Romans, and they followed Roman surveying uh, method methodology here, uh, they, they looked to what was exactly the center of the city, and they placed the Cardo, uh, the north-south street, and the Decumanus, the east-west street, at that exact midpoint of the city. And then they located, as they liked to do, the forum of the city, the great meeting and marketplace, right at the intersection of the Cardo and of the Decumanus. And that is exactly where we see the forum that was begun in the Samnite period, right at the intersection of those two original streets. Then over time, obviously, as they expanded the city, the Cardo, grew, the Cardo grew and the Decumanus grew, and it didn't end up exactly at the center of the larger city, but it was at the center of the original city. The, let's begin, in fact, with the Forum, because the Forum was begun itself during the time of the Samnites. You'll see from your monument list that I've given you a date of the second half of the second century BC uh, for the Forum at Pompeii. And again, that indicates to us, because of the chronology of the city, of the history of the city, that it was begun in Samnite times. Uh, you see here on the screen a, an excellent plan of the forum as it was and as it grew over time, as buildings were added over time. This plan is from the text, one of your textbooks from Ward Perkins, and I think it, uh, it, it, it deserves uh, you know, careful study. Uh, we're, we're, let's describe it together today. We see that the central part of the forum, which was again the, essentially the main meeting and marketplace of the forum, is a, a, a very elongated rectangle with the temple, a Capitolian, a Capitolium, a temple to Jupiter, located on one of the short ends. And you should be immediately, your mind's eye should go immediately to the, uh, the sanctuary designs that we saw last time. Think, for example, of the Sanctuary of Hercules Victor at Tivoli, uh, where we saw that the temple was pushed up against one of the back walls, in that case the long wall, and dominated the space in front of it. We see the same kind of scheme here, where we see this rectangular space with the temple pushed up, in this case on one of the short walls, pushed up against the back wall, and then dominating the space in front of it. The forum itself is surrounded by col a col columns, a colonnade, as you can see here, and, uh, and it is open to the sky, open to the sky. Then uh, deployed around it all the other important buildings that needed to be in a forum. The Aquaria or Senate House over here, the Basilica or Law Court over here, another temple, in this case the Temple of Apollo, and then a series of buildings that were added later on the right side. A wonderful building of a woman that we're not going to be talking about this semester called Eumachia, uh, who, and it gives you some sense that women could wield power. Uh, it wasn't easy. They couldn't vote. They couldn't hold public office. But they could sometimes wield power, and this particular woman did in Pompeii, a very large building uh, that was for her and for her trade guild. Uh, a lararium or a place, a shrine, a market or mechelum up there. Some of these added later. Uh, and, but the ones that are particularly critical to our understanding of the Samnite city are the Capitolium and are the Basilica, which both date to the second century BC. Here's a view of, oh, I'm sorry, I did want to say something about the Google Earth image on the, um, on the left. Uh, this is a Google Earth, Earth image, which I tried to take in such a way that one could, can see it almost exactly the same vantage point as the plan. And you can see everything here that I've already pointed out, the open rectangular space, the colonnade, the temple pushed up against the back wall, the Temple of Jupiter, the Basilica over here, the Temple of Apollo, Eumachia's building here, the uh, Senate House over here, and so on. And this, again, underscores the value of Google Earth uh, as one can, can look down on these buildings and compare what one sees to the master plan. 
This is a view of the colonnade. Uh, it's a two-story colonnade at the Forum of Pompeii. And you can see the same thing that we saw happening in the theater of Marcellus in Rome, that the columns that they have used, they have looked at the Greek, the Greek orders, the Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian, and they have selected here to use the Doric for the first story and the uh, Ionic for the second story. This colonnade does not date to the Samnite period, we believe. Uh, that it was put up later, uh, but it, uh, it's made out of white limestone, uh, and it probably, again, does belong to a, uh, a renovation of the forum of a somewhat later date. Look also uh, near the columns, and you will see a series of bases, uh, a large base over here, a smaller base over here. You see a lot of these still in the forum today. And what these bases were for, of course, were to support statues. Statues, and then there would have been inscription on the base identifying who that was. Sometimes they were statues of the reigning dynast in Rome, the age of Augustus, it might be Augustus or his wife Livia. Uh, but they also honored the, uh, the most important people of the city of Pompeii, magistrates, great benefactors. Some Eumachia, we know, had a portrait inside her own building uh, honoring her, standing next to the Empress Livia. Uh, so that's, you have to imagine that while the forum is quite empty today, that in antiquity there would have been all of these bases with equestrian statues and full-length statues vying with one another uh, for attention. The individuals honored there sort of jostling with one another to, uh, to underscore their, their fame, at least within uh, their own city. This is a view of the Temple of Jupiter, or the Capitolium, in the Forum of Pompeii, an extremely important building. Uh, and one that you can see from the monument li list also began uh, what began to be put up quite early, in 150 BC. But it's triple cella honoring the Capitoline triad, Jupiter, Juno, and Minerva, was, it won't surprise you to hear, put up only after the Romans made Pompeii a colony. And it, that happened in 80 BC. So you'll see that I've given you a date of 150 for the temple, but 80 BC for uh, the renovation of the cella to incorporate these three spaces for uh, statues of the Capitoline Triad. Let's look at the plan first. You see it down here at the bottom. Let me move that arrow away. You see it down here at the bottom, uh, and you can see that the plan of the temple corresponds uh, to plans that we've seen for other temples that we've studied thus far, this term, Temple of Portunus, for example, where we see this combination of an Etruscan plan and a Greek elevation. Uh, you can see here the facade emphasis, single staircase, deep porch, freestanding columns in that porch, the flat back wall, as was characteristic of Etruscan <coughs> temple design, uh, the plain side walls over here. Uh, we can see all of that in this plan. Uh, and we also know that the building was made out of stone, tufa, in this case, tufa, not from Rome, but tufa from this part of Italy, from uh, the, the Campanian region, tufa there for the, both the columns and also the capital. So a stone building. So this same combination of Etruscan plan and Greek elevation that we saw in Rome. This view of the temple also shows you that it had a tall podium, as was characteristic of these other early temples. Here you can see the remains of the stone columns uh, and of the building itself. It's not as well preserved as we wish it were, uh, but enough is there to give us a very good sense of what the Capitolium looked like in uh, ancient Roman times. I mentioned that the other early structure added to the Forum complex was the Basilica of Pompeii. And I'd like to turn to that now. The Basilica of Pompeii dates to around 120 BC. You see its plan here again in the bottom left. And you'll remember it's splayed off from the Forum to the left bottom side as you face the Temple of Jupiter. You can see that the plan of the Basilica is very interesting because it actually is quite similar to the plan of the Forum itself. It is a rectangular space, not as large and not as elongated, but nonetheless a rectangular space. Its entranceway is over here from the Forum. Uh, you can see that there are columns inside, a colonnade, just as we saw in the Forum itself. And the building is, or is, is, is organized, as is the Forum itself, axially, so that there is a focus, something at the end that serves as the focus, and then the axiality comes from that. 
Uh, we see the focus over here at the end. It's not another temple. It is a tribunal, a tribunal on which the judge would sit to try the law cases that came here. The main difference between the basilica and the forum itself is that the basilica was roofed in antiquity. The roof is no longer there, as you saw in the Google Earth view. But it was roofed in antiquity, whereas, again, the forum uh, was open to the sky. The view that you see of the basilica as it looks today is also very illuminating. We are looking toward the tribunal. You can see the tribunal is actually extremely well preserved. We get a very good sense of what it looked like in antiquity. It itself has a tall podium. We can imagine the magistrate holding court uh, up here on the top of that tall podium beneath, between the Corinthian uh, columns in this case. We're not absolutely sure, but we believe the second story, which has smaller columns, they diminish in size on the second story, uh, also were uh, uh, Corinthian columns, because you can see at least one of them. One of them is restored at the top right, but that one is a Corinthian capital. So we believe Corinthian order on the lower story, Corinthian order on the second story as well, beginning to show this Roman penchant for uh, the Corinthian order, which we've already discussed. Uh, and you can also see here uh, some of the, uh, the lower parts of the columns that would have been encircling the center of the structure and dividing uh, the central space from two aisles, one on either side. Uh, it looks like they're made out of brick, but they're actually made out of a tile that looks like brick. Uh, brick wasn't being used quite this early, but a tile resembling brick was used in Pompeii. And we can see that served as the core of the columns. They would have been stuccoed over, though, and looked more like white marble, uh, indicating to us again this desire of the Romans to make things look, uh, at least, or the Samnites at this point, and ultimately the Romans when they renovated this structure, to make it look uh, as Greek as possible. Yeah. Why are the columns <laughs> chopped off? You mean almost all in the same, <laughs> same place? You know, these, these things were often pieced, and so sometimes they can, that can happen. And it's actually one of the, you raise a very interesting <laughs> issue, uh, because one of the things that, uh, that archaeologists are beginning to speculate only recently about, and you see this in some of the most recent literature, is, you know, we, we think, here, here we say, and I said it today, that this city was preserved exactly as it was in 79. And yet, when you look at what it looks like, it's actually pretty, in pretty ruinous state. Uh, so that could mean two things. One, that they didn't make all that much progress in that 17 years, that they worked very hard, but that the damage had been so significant uh, that they were not able to, uh, to bring these things back you know, as much as they had hoped to. But it also may be just the destruction. I mean, while, while um, the ash and lava covered the city and protected it, it obviously wrought some damage as well. So that some of these things you know, obviously came down, and over time, uh, the material got you know, washed away or taken away or whatever. But it is curious that they sort of broke in exactly the same place. But it's because, because of the construction technique and the way in which they were pieced together. They would have been stacked on like Yeah, like exactly. Let me show you another view of the right side wall of the basilica. Uh, you see these columns here again, very regular. There's a, a young woman standing right here, so that gives you a sense of scale. She's about only up to the, this, this point of the column, so you can see how large in scale these, all, these were in ancient Roman times. But if you look at the two that are closest to the tribunal, you will see that they have ionic capitals. So that gives us enough to go on to speculate that the first story of columns, and there were two stories on the walls, uh, two stories of columns. The lower ones were ionic, and you can see that they are attached or engaged into the walls. Uh, those were ionic, and then we believe that there was a second story. Uh, that we, we know there was a second story, but that the sec second story of columns uh, would have been Corinthian capitals uh, up there. This is a restored view of what the basilica would have looked like uh, in uh, the, in 120 after it was built, 120 BC after it was built. And you can see here the tribunal. We're looking toward the tribunal. It's two-storied, Corinthian order on both stories, tall podium. We see here in black uh, the, um, the columns of the central space that divide the center from the two side aisles. And here you can see very well the way in which they created two stories, a bottom story and an upper story. You could, be, you could walk on that upper story. 
uh, and using the Ionic capitals in the first story and smaller Corinthian columns in the second story. And it's important for me to note in terms of the development, the later development of basilican architecture, that this basilica in Pompeii of this early date did not have what's called a clear story. C-L-E-R-E-S-T-O-R-Y. C-L-E-R-E-S-T-O-R-Y. A clear story. What is a clear story? A clear story is a series of windows open to the outside that allow views out and light in. This building does not have a clear story. So it probably, in its heyday uh, in the Samnite period, was probably on the dark side. But we will see that clear story, the clear story is incorporated into later Roman basilican architecture. One of the greatest buildings, without any question, at Pompeii, and one that everyone flocks to see, and if you have never been to Pompeii, let me just note that it is a little bit further out than some of the other structures, but it is a new to not be missed monument. And in fact, I know at least one of you has already spoken to me about an upcoming trip to Rome uh, and Pompeii, and um, consequently I just say that you absolutely need, I mean you could spend days at Pompeii, but you must have a full day, full day for Pompeii, because in order to get to the, uh, not just to see the forum and what's in the center and a few of the houses, to get out, it doesn't take that long, it's a nice walk, it's not a big, not, not a huge distance, but uh, people forget to do it because it's on the outskirts. But you, you really must get to the two end points are the amphitheater and the um, Villa of the Mysteries, both of them absolutely incredible to see and, and too often missed by tourists, uh, but two of the greatest sights at the city of Pompeii. This is the amphitheater as it looks today from the air. The amphitheater is one of several buildings that were begun immediately upon the Romans making Pompeii a Roman colony in 80 BC. You can only imagine those veterans, those army veterans of war who had just been settled in their new homes clamoring uh, from day one for the amphitheater, a place where they could go for gladiatorial and animal combat. This is what they wanted to see. Uh, and consequently, no local magistrate or emperor worth their salt would allow the city to uh, continue without, oh, there were no, was no emperor in 80 BC, but uh, would, would allow the, um, the city to, be, uh, to, to go on without an amphitheater. So that was one of the first orders of business. This amphitheater at Pompeii, which dates, we believe, to 80 to 70 BC, is one is an incredibly important building for the history of Roman architecture because it is our first preserved stone amphitheater. And all the amphitheaters that come later, including the great Colosseum in Rome, are based on buildings like this one. This was a great experiment in amphitheater design uh, already in 80 to 70 BC. How did they go about building this amphitheater? Uh, what they seem to have done is to, uh, to excavate the central area, the earth of the central area, to create a space for the oval arena, which you see here. And I put the terms on the monument list for you. Uh, the arena, which you see here. So they've excavated that central space, placed the arena there. Then they have piled up earth. It's essentially an earthen bowl is what they've created here, an earthen bowl with the excavated space for the arena, and then piled up the earth on the outside to support the seats, to support the seats, to serve as a support for the seats. There was no natural hill here, so they had to do this on their own. Uh, so they build up the earth, they place the seats, they line that earthen bowl with seats, stone <coughs> seats. Uh, and they create the cabia of the <laughs> amphitheater, because we use the same term for the seats of an amphitheater as for the seats of a theater. The cavea, or C-A-V-E-A, -E the cavea, or the seats of the amphitheater. And you can also see here, light in, in indicated, uh, the wedge-shaped sections of the seats, just as in a theater, they are called the same thing, the cuneus, C-U-N-E-U-S, or in the plural, cunei, C-U-N-E-I. Uh, so these wedge-shaped individual sections, a cuneus, all of them together, cunei, the cunei or wedge-shaped sections of the seats apparent here. The exits and entrances, and there are a couple of major ones on either side, those have a colorful and unforgettable name. I guarantee you, you will remember this name for the rest of your lives. Uh, those exits and entrances are called vomitoria, uh, which means they literally uh, spit forth spectators, vomitoria. 
uh, these, exits, these entrances and exits to the amphitheater. Let me also note that the outer ring, and the outer ring is extremely important because it buttresses uh, the uh, earthen bowl. That outer ring is made of concrete, concrete that we'll see is faced with opus and keratum work. Uh, and the entire structure is encircled by a, an annular vault, one of these ring vaults that encircles the entire structure that is made out of concrete. So another early example of the, uh, of the, uh, of the masterful use of concrete faced with opus and keratum work, in this case in the amphitheater in Pompeii. I show you a Google Earth image of this, uh, which gives you a very good sense of the oval shape of the original structure. I think it's important to compare the exterior of the amphitheater at Pompeii, which is extremely well preserved, as you can see here, uh, with the experiment at the much earlier uh, sanctuary of Fortin Fortuna Primagenia at Palestrina, where we also saw uh, this use of concrete faced with opus and keratum work. If we look at the facade of the uh, amphitheater at Pompeii, we'll see, first of all, how exceedingly well preserved it was. Uh, we also see uh, the, this, this uh, unique staircase here uh, with uh, stairs, and I'll show you a side view in a moment where you can see those stairs, stairs leading up on both sides uh, to the apex, and then a series of arches uh, in diminishing size, larger in the center and diminishing in size as they go down the ramp to correspond to the shape of the ramp, uh, and then additional arcades over here. These are what are called blind arcades because you'll see that they have wa a wall in the back. You can't walk in these arcades and get into uh, the amphitheater. There are only two barrel vaulted corridors, and you saw them in the general view, one on either long side uh, of the oval. Uh, that you can actually walk in and out of the, of the amphitheater from them. But you can go up the staircase and enter the amphitheater as well from the cavea. Go up to the top and then just go at the uppermost part of the steps and walk down uh, to your seats that way. So the blind arcades we can see here. We can see that once again, just as we saw in some of the other buildings we looked at last time, the way in which they've used opus and keratum for most of the wall, the facing for the concrete for most of the wall, but they have used stone, uh, both uh, blocks of stone and these bourgeois blocks, wedge-shaped blocks, to uh, articulate the arcades, uh, to make them more prominent and also to give the building uh, <coughs> additional uh, stability. What's interesting here, and one of the reasons I also bring back the sanctuary of Fortuna Primagenia, is the fact that the Romans, again, are giving you some options in terms of how you get into this building. You can get in through the barrel vaulted corridors, uh, or, uh, or, or you can climb up this distinctive staircase. And by the way, we have no other, this is, truly is a unique staircase. We have no other one like it in the history of Roman architecture. So you, you have those options, but again, they are still predetermining the way in which you go. I mean, they give you a few options, but uh, within that scheme, it is clearly a predetermined path uh, up, up the staircase over here and then through only those two barrel vaulted uh, corridors. And we talked about that at the Fortuna Primagenia Sanctuary, uh, up the ramps and then up the staircase in the center, a very similar way of thinking about getting people from one place to another in an orderly way. The staircase is so distinctive uh, that, and here I show you a, a side view of it where you can actually see the steps leading up. And if you, know, if you go visit there, you should try both options. I mean, go down the corridor, but also it's a lot of fun to go up the steps and into the cavea. Uh, but it's so distinctive and, and never to be repeated uh, that when we look, there's a painting that survives from a Pompeian house. We'll look at it in more detail later in the semester. But I wanted to just show it to you now uh, because it is so apparent that it is a representation uh, of the amphitheater at Pompeii, which is not surprising since this is a house in Pompeii. But you see that distinctive staircase here with the steps, uh, the way in which you can enter into the cavea. You get a sense of the cavea and the kind of goings-on that, that, that happened in uh, this Pompeii amphitheater. 
Uh, but you can also see, this is a very important detail that, uh, that is, and this is the only place where we actually have a representation of it. You can see that at the uppermost part of the cavea, there is an awning called a velarium, and I've put that word on the monument list for you. An awning that was supported by poles that were located on brackets at the uppermost part of the amphitheater. And that awning, the purpose of that awning, the Pompeians seem to have a thing for protecting the Romans in general, for protecting people in inclement weather. Uh, so they put these awnings up when it rained. Uh, they put these awnings up to protect uh, those who were there to see a gladiatorial combat, to protect them uh, from that rain. <coughs> One last view of the amphitheater of Pompeii. We are looking at it at its, its bowl-shaped arena, as you can see here, and the seats that do survive uh, to get a sense of the interior. Here you can see very well the two uh, barrel vaulted entrances and exits, uh, one on either side. And that's the only way, again, those blind arcades, you can't get in that way. And you can see that very well here. Those are the only entrance or exits uh, into the theater besides the staircase. And in the introductory lecture, I made the point, and I'll just bring it back home again, uh, that the Yale Bowl here in New Haven is based on the amphitheater in Pompeii. There's no question about that. In fact, if one goes back in the literature on the bowl and its original construction, it is even mentioned in original articles that the architects were looking back. I mean, I'm not making this up. The architects were actually looking back at the Pompeii amphitheater as a model. And you can see the the relationship. When you look at the bowl from the air, you can see it is a bowl. It's, it's kind of a bowl shape, almost a, exactly like the shape of the Pompeii Amphitheater. This aerial view, by the way, was taken at the time of the 100th game uh, between Yale and Harvard. And you can see the stands were packed. Uh, the major difference between these two amphitheaters uh, is the fact that the one in Pompeii was made to hold 20,000 people. The one in Yale can hold up to as many as 78,000 people. So we have a larger uh, amphitheater, so to speak, here uh, than they did and do in the, theater, in the city of Pompeii. I want to move from the amphitheater to the other great entertainment district of Pompeii, and that was the theater and the music hall, the theater and the music hall. And I want to show those to you fairly quickly. Uh, we see them here in plan, the theater in red and the uh, music hall here in a kind of, I don't know, chartreuse. Uh, as you can see, it dates to uh, 80 to 70 BC, so another example of a building that was added when the Romans uh, gained ascendance of this part of the world. Uh, and uh, a couple of terms again, we can see if we look at the theater, uh, we can see the, uh, the fact that the theater is semicircular in shape, or the cavea is semicircular in shape. We can see the wedge-shaped cunei up there. Uh, we can also see that the orchestra is semicircular in shape, not round, and that there's a scena, S-C-E-N-A, or a scenae frons, as I called it last time, a stage building at the front. There is also a space over here which we call the porticus. And again, I put that on the monument list for you, the porticus. What was the porticus? The porticus was an open rectangular space with covered colonnades on either side. The purpose of the porticus was to have a place where people could go during intermission uh, to, uh, to stretch their legs uh, during the intermission of the comedy or tragedy that they were there to see. Uh, and there were little shops along the way, uh, little spaces along the way. Some of them served as shops for playbills and uh, other souvenirs uh, from the evening's experience, uh, but also that served as spaces where props and uh, you know, scenery and, and uh, costumes and all sorts of things that were needed in the theatr theatrical performances could be kept. So that's the porticus. Then over here we see the music hall. It's a smaller version of the theater, but it's designed in exactly the same way with a semicircular orchestra, the semicircular cavea, the division into cunei, as you can see here, a small and le much less elaborate scena in the front. The major difference between the two, and we see this not just in Pompeii but throughout Roman architecture, is not just the scale, that the theater is always much bigger than the music hall, but that the theater was open to the sky and the music hall was, had a roof. Uh, and that roof, uh, that roof, the reason for the roof and the smaller music hall and the reason for the smaller size was to, be, to make the acoustics as good as they could possibly be. And that was easier to do in a roof building and in a building of smaller scale. 
a Google Earth view of the theater and music hall as they look today. And you can see they're quite well preserved. You can see the exact shapes that we looked at in plan over, over there. Here's our porticus, for example, and you get a sense of how pleasant that might be able to be uh, during intermission time. Uh, what this view also gives you a sense of, however, is the way in which these two buildings are embedded in the rest of the city, that they, are, they do make up an entertainment district, but at the same time they are very close to the city streets uh, that have uh, on, along them houses and shops and so on and so forth. So very closely embedded into the life, into the commercial life and the residential life of the city, even though this was intended, again, as a great entertainment area for those who live there. And I made this point before, but I'll make it quickly again, that while Roman theaters like the theater at Pompeii are based on Greek prototypes, there are some differences. Uh, they, the two theaters, this is the Greek theater at Epidaurus of the mid-fourth century BC. They both have the stone seats. They both have, which is called the cavea. They both have these wedge-shaped sections of seats. They both have a stage building, although the Greek one is much simpler. Uh, and uh, they also, the, the, but the major differences between the two is that the Greek theater has a circular orchestra, whereas the Roman theater has a, and this is the theater of Pompeii, has a semicircular orchestra. Uh, and the other major difference, the most significant one, is the Greeks built their theaters on hillsides. As you can see at Epidaurus, the Romans built their theaters, and this is the case in Pompeii, on a hill made out of concrete. I want to turn to an extremely important building, and one that I am going to uh, come back to on a number of occasions during this semester. So put an asterisk next to this one as a, a, a particularly important building and one that it's almost certain I'll find some way of incorporating into the uh, mid first midterm uh, because I think it's so significant uh, and it will, it will turn up again and again and again in the course of the term, especially when we talk about later bath architecture. It is the Stabian Baths of Pompeii. It dates to the second half of the second century uh, BC and it was remodeled in the first half of the first century BC. The Stabian Baths are one of several bath buildings at Pompeii. I mentioned in the introductory lecture that uh, the, these houses in Pompeii did not have running water, and so access to bathing and to water for daily use was obviously critical. Uh, and the baths served that purpose, the place where one could go and bathe. But they were also, they also became great social centers, great places where you really wanted to go and hang out with your friends uh, while you were sitting in the sauna. And, uh, and so they take on a very, they are a very important piece of life in cities like Pompeii. The Stabian baths, as their date indicate, are very early. They're begun already under the Samnites, and they have some extremely interesting features. And once again, I'm going to have to go over some of the bath terminology. You can see here that if you walk along the street, you just see a series of cubicles which served as shops, so you know, fairly unprepossessing. Uh, but there is an entranceway through those shops into a very large open space surrounded by columns on three sides that is called the palestra of the baths. The palestra was the exercise courts where you jogged and, and, uh, you know, and ran around and so on. And after you exerted yourself and got all sweaty, uh, you could jump into the pool that was located over here. This was not a place to do laps. Uh, it was pretty much a soaking pool or a pool where you could cool off. Uh, but the technical term for that is either a piscina, which is what's on the monument list for you, or a natatio, N-A-T-A-T-I-O, a little pool where you could splash yourself after exerting yourself by exercising in the palestra. The, build, the bath block itself, the bathing rooms themselves, are located uh, on the other side of the plan, on the right side as you see it here, the northern side actually of the plan. Uh, and we see two sets of spaces, this set of four down here, this one, this one, this one, and this one, and then a set of a comparable number of rooms up there. These early Roman baths, there was a separation between the men's section of the baths and the women's section of the baths. And I'm sorry, ladies, but um, we'll have to accept the fact that at least in ancient Pompeii, uh, the women's section was quite nondescript. It was much smaller than the men's. At least they had one, thank goodness. Uh, but it was smaller than the men's, and the rooms had no architectural distinction whatsoever. All of the designer's effort went into creating uh, a wonderful set of rooms for the men. 
And we see the men's rooms again over here, these four, and the women's at the top. Consequently, the only ones that have any merit architecturally in my share showing you today are the ones for the men's baths down here. Uh, the four rooms, the four key rooms to both the men's and women's sections were the apoditerium, and again, these words are on the monument list for you, the apoditerium, which was the dressing room. It's a fairly, again, it's large, but a fairly nondescript <coughs> rectangular room here. You can see it right down here. And the way it was designed uh, was that you went in, and there were no lockers, no private lockers, but uh, there were benches where you could, when you got undressed, you could just take your clothes and put them in a little pile on that bench. Uh, you had to just take on faith that no one was going to steal any of your belongings. And if you were very well-to-do, uh, some of the very well-to-do Romans, men and women, brought slaves with them, their slave, their private slave, to watch their stuff uh, while they were in the sauna with their friends. From the apoditerium, you go into the so-called tepidarium of the baths, also usually a plain rectangular room, even in the men's section, which served as the warm room, where you started to warm yourself up. You went from the tepidarium into the caldarium of the bath, which was the uh, hot room, uh, the, where you really, where you re it was the sauna, essentially, of the bath. And consequently, there was a, um, a basin over here with cold water. So if you got too hot, you could go and splash yourself uh, with that cold water. So apoditerium, tepidarium, caldarium. By then, you're really heated up. And you can make your way back into this room over here, which is called the Frigidarium, or the cold room. The Frigidarium was a place that you could really cool off. And I think you can see by looking at these, the two most important rooms architecturally, you can see this even in plan, are the Caldarium, which has a, an apse or curved uh, element at the end, uh, and this room in particular, the Frigidarium, uh, because it is a round structure with radiating alcoves, and we're going to see that it's domed. This is a particularly, again, star, 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 star. One of the most important rooms that I've shown you, probably the most important room I've shown you thus far uh, this semester, in that it is going to have a very long future architecturally. What you see here basically ends up as the Pantheon uh, someday. Uh, this round space, round structure with radiating alcoves, and as we'll see, a dome, and not only a dome, but a hole in the ceiling, an oculus that allows light into the structure. Uh, how were these baths uh, heated? How were the hot rooms heated? Through a system called a hypocost. Again, I put the, the word on the monument list for you. A hypocost, H-Y-P-O-C-A-U-S-T. What was a hypocost system? A hypocost system was a system by which they put terracotta uh, uh, terracotta um, tubes in the floor and behind the walls. Uh, they blew hot air into those, and they also raised up the pavement of the floor on a series of stacked tiles, and you can see that extremely well. Here's a very well-preserved hypocaust from the Stabian Baths. Placed these tiles on stack, stacks of tiles, left, leaving space in between them, and put braziers uh, between those tin, tin, you know, metal braziers, uh, metal bowls that held hot coals and so on. And that, from those hot coals, obviously it's slaves who had to you know, keep those, those coals hot, but s coals that were um, placed uh, in these um, pans that, uh, that uh, helped also to heat the pavement that was located above. The, this very important room, the Frigidarium of the Stabian Baths, you see it here as it looks today, a small, round space. Uh, it has a, it would, would have had a pool in the center, a round pool, radiating alcoves, uh, a dome, a dome that is open to the sky with an oculus that allows light into it. You can see the remains of paint, stucco, and then paint, blue and red paint, probably some kind of marine scene. Uh, included here, but this I can't under, uh, underscore enough the importance of this particular room and the future that this design has for Roman architecture. I'd like to show you um, another bath at Pompeii, the so-called Forum Baths. The Forum Baths are interesting because they're later. They date to, as you can see from your monument list, to 80 BC. So this is what the Romans did when they came in and took over Pompeii and were making it into one of those mini Romes, those cities in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the model of Rome. And you can see it is very, very similar uh, to what was going on in the Stabian Baths in the earlier Samnite Baths uh, with the same palestra. We see a palestra up at two 
the exercise court. We don't seem to have a natatio in this particular plan. Uh, we see the men's section over here at 3, 4, 5, and 6, and the women's section over here, 7, 8, 9, 10. Again, the women's section off to the side of no ar architectural distinction whatsoever. Uh, the men's over here, and you could enter the men's either through the palestra or from an opening over here at 1. We see the same set of rooms that we saw at the Stabian Baths. We see the apoditerium or dressing, undressing and dressing room over here at 3 the tepidarium at 5, the caldarium at 6, and the caldarium at 6 is of the same shape as the caldarium in the Stabian Baths, a rectangular room with an apse at the end and a, um, a basin for cold water splashes. And then you go back again to the frigidarium, and you can see the frigidarium in the baths, uh, Forum Baths at Pompeii, the same shape as that in the Stabian Baths at Pompeii, a round, a small round room with radiating alcoves. I can show you views both of the um, tepidarium of the Forum Baths, extremely well preserved, as you can see here. You can also see they've used a great barrel vault uh, for this room. It isn't as large as it looks here, but it's a sizable room. Uh, and this is a very good uh, place to show you, by the way, to give you a sense of how these things were decorated, how so many uh, rooms, to Roman rooms today, Roman buildings today, are stripped of their original decoration. Uh, but that decoration was often quite beautiful and ostentatious, and we can see here, a, we can get here a sense of that. You can see the wall has been stuccoed over, and then also in stucco, these great uh, flowering acanthus plants and uh, creatures flying uh, above, animals, human feature, uh, gods and goddesses flying above. Paint was, a, you know, you, they use paint as well, red and blue and white and other colors uh, to accentuate the design. This gives you some sense of the flavor of these. And then this wonderful detail below of these Atlas figures who are shown holding up uh, the vault of this particular room. It gives you some sense of why Romans flocked to these places, not only because they, they had, it was the only place they could bathe themselves, but also because <coughs> it was just a wonderful space to be in and to enjoy, again, the company of friends. This is a view of what room? In the Forum Baths? The Caldarium. Excellent, Neil. The Caldarium uh, over here with its uh, rectangular shape and then its apse and its cold water ba basin for cold water splashes. Uh, and then look at the ceiling, how wonderful. In that, in that uh, apse, you see a semi-dome. A, a round hole or an oculus in that semi-dome to allow light into it. So here we see them exploring oculi in semi-domes as well as in domes. And then these square and rectangular uh, uh, spaces, uh, holes in the ceiling, uh, openings in the ceiling that have been placed there also to allow light into the system so that you could use the room, but also to create the kind of wonderful light effects that it does when you have rays of sunshine uh, coming in on you while you are uh, in your sauna. This is uh, a couple of more views. Uh, this is a couple of views of the frigidarium of the forum baths. You can see the uh, dome up above, the oculus in that dome. You can see some of the stucco decoration still preserved. You can see the alcoves here, the radiating alcoves, and some of the stucco decoration here. Sea creatures against a red background. And this is a restored view of what the frigidarium would have looked like with the pool in the center, a nice place to relax, the radiating uh, apses over here, and then the dome. Uh, with the oculus and with the light uh, streaming in. Again, I can't underscore enough the importance of both of these for Gadaria uh, for the future of Roman architecture. Uh, the other importance of the Forum Baths is the Forum Baths is today where you can eat, and if you're there for the full day, as I recommend you be, you're going to want to eat at some point. Uh, and there is a cafeteria, which doesn't look like much, but actually the food is not bad. The Italians have a very hard time making bad pasta, so you can always get some good pasta at the snack bar, and you will want to make your way, there's a few views of it, make your way uh, to the Forum Baths if you're there for any length of time. Very quickly, I just want to remind you, we talked about this in the introductory lecture, that one of the main uh, reasons that Pompeii <coughs> is so interesting to us today is because it tells us so much about the daily life, not only of the Pompeians, but of the Romans in general, because we have all these wonderful shops still preserved at Pompeii. This was a bakery. We see the millstones that were actually used for the grinding of the grain still preserved. We see the oven over here looking wonderfully like a modern pizza oven, as you can see. And we also, believe it or not, have from Pompeii a petrified bread that's <laughs> still is preserved uh, that gives you a sense of what 
Pompeian bread looked like, and it looks, uh, it looks strikingly like our pizzas with the segments, uh, segments of the bread. So if you want to have a sense of where pizza came from here, I told you the Romans, again, there's nothing the Romans didn't invent, bread, pizza, whatever. Uh, but you see that petrified bread giving you a very good sense of, the, of, the, of what was produced uh, in this particular bakery. I also mentioned in the introductory lecture the fast food stands of Pompeii, the thermopolium in the singular and the thermopolia in the plural. These fast food stands where you could get a bite real, real quickly. The way they were designed was to have a great counter uh, in them with recesses. Uh, uh, fresh, hot, and cold food was put out, obviously, every day. Uh, and if you were hungry, you just went up to the counter, you took a peek at what was there, you pointed out what you wanted, uh, and you could eat on the run. Uh, the Romans were never far to have you know, their state religion and their family religion far from them. Uh, and you can also see a nod to the gods over here. There's a shrine uh, with some of the representations of the household gods, even in this fast food emporium. We have wine shops from Pompeii as well. I show you actually a scene of one of the storage rooms at Pompeii. Uh, that you can see actually as you walk along, <laughs> it's a wonderful ruffling of the <laughs> turning to the next page. Uh, the, um, these wine, these amphoras, these great uh, clay amphoras that held wine uh, that are located in one of these uh, storage areas that one can see as one walks along the Forum on the left side in Pompeii today. But you can imagine these on shelves. Uh, in a wine shop uh, of ancient Pompeii, uh, offering wines uh, gathered from all over the world uh, for discerning uh, uh, enophi enophiles, is that the word, enophiles. Uh, connecting all of these um, shops to one another were, of course, the streets of the city. The streets of the city are extremely well preserved. I show you t here a couple of views of the crossing of the Cardo and the Decumanus in Pompeii. Uh, and you can see exactly what the streets look like. You can see the uh, multi-sided paving stones of the streets. You can see the sidewalks looking uncannily modern. Uh, you can see, I don't, you can't see exactly here, but there are drains along the way to allow rainwater to filter off uh, the streets. Uh, and um, all of this, again, uh, an extremely <coughs> modern look. And the streets of Pompeii give us the best sense of any, of any streets of any preserved <coughs> ancient city of what, uh, what uh, the streets looked like in any given Roman town. These streets had along them, again, because of needs for water, had along them fountains. Here's a very modest fountain where we see a representation of the goddess Ceres. Uh, C-E-R-E-S series with her cornucopia and the fountain spout coming out of her mouth. Uh, and uh, you can see this is the sort of thing when the Romans just needed a little bit of water for household use, they would go out to the local fountain. So as you walk along the streets of Pompeii, you see a lot of these small fountains. You also see graffiti. What would a city be without some graffiti on its buildings? Any of you who have been in Rome recently know there is too much graffiti. There's like a graffiti uh, craze. I mean, the Romans have always had a lot of graffiti, but it's gotten so bad, it's, it's almost unimaginable now. But the graffiti tradition was alive and well in Pompeii, uh, and you see it here covered with glass, but you see it here, you see it here and there in the city as you wander by, and it gives you a sense that people did write right on their buildings. These, what they wrote on these buildings tended to be political for the most part. You know, you'd see graffiti that would say things like, uh, vote for, um, Vote for Barbatus, the bearded one. Uh, he's, he'll be the best guy for the office, and he's pretty handsome, too. That's the kind of graffiti that you'll see as you walk along, if, you, if your Latin is good, that you'll see as you walk along uh, the streets of Pompeii. You'll also see these big blocks of stone. And there are people who look at these and they think, oh, how interesting, that's debris from Vesuvius. It's not debris from Vesuvius, <laughs> clearly. These are there deliberately. These are stepping stones. The Romans were so ingenious and so, again, concerned about how to protect people in inclement weather uh, that they created, they, they put these stepping stones all around the city, usually at the cross sections of two streets, so that if there was torrential rain and if the water piled up and if the drains couldn't quite handle it, uh, you could get across the street uh, without stepping in the water. I mean, would that we had this in the slushiness that was New Haven in the last week. I can't tell you how many times I think, why doesn't Yale have stepping stones? Uh, we really could use them. But here they are, and you can see very clearly the ruts that come from the carts 
uh, that have been that were made between the stepping stones by those carts constantly riding through them, and it shows you that they had to orchestrate the wheels of the carts in such a way that they would span uh, the stepping stones. But it's a very ingenious thing. They're fun to look at, fun to walk on, fun, really fun to take pictures. I have tons of them. I, I didn't decided not to bring a personal picture this time of me or anyone else in my family on stepping stones or other Yaleys. I've got lots of those too. Uh, I didn't bring those today, but I did bring something I'm really proud of because in all the years I've taught this monument, this city, excuse me, I've always wanted to actually show what it looked like when rain, uh, when there was, when it had rained. And since I've been to Pompeii so so many times over the years, uh, but it doesn't tend to rain when I go there. You know, June, July, August just doesn't rain. So I've never been able to do that. I was there this past June. And lo and behold, I was very upset because who wants to wander around the city of Pompeii in the rain? But I had one day to go there, and I was there, and I said, wow, it's raining. Here's my chance. So I finally was able to get some views of what happens. And this was right at, we had a torrential rain for about a half an hour. Then the sun came out, and this is what you see as you wander the streets. You see that the water has accumulated, but again, lo and behold, you can easily make your way across that street, across those stepping stones uh, nonetheless. Just a very few words on uh, what happens to the streets of the city of Pompeii, or any Roman city for that matter, when you leave the gates and you go out on the intercity roads. Many of those intercity roads become cemeteries. The Romans used these roads as their cemeteries. The Romans had uh, a, uh, a religious belief that, you, that there was a separation between the city of the living and the city of the dead. Uh, so all of the tombs are outside the walls of the city. Uh, so you see at Pompeii two extremely well-preserved tomb streets, the, tre the Street of the Tombs and the Via Nucera, which is the one you see here, N-U-C-E-R-A, with tombs of all sorts of shapes and sizes. I'm not going to go into these in any detail in this course. There is a paper topic for any of you who get interested in tomb architecture on the tombs of Pompeii. We will look at some tombs in Rome in great detail. Uh, but I'm just going to give you a glimpse of them here. They come in all sizes and shapes. They're very, very interesting. They honor the people who were buried there, including there's an, a bench tomb, for example, where you can sit and think on the, uh, the life and times of, of the individual who was buried there. Uh, so a, an absolutely fascinating, fascinating uh, street with a lot of different tomb types that show the variety of tomb architecture under the Romans. I'd like to end today. <clears throat> I'd like to end today by, by making at least a passing reference to a matter which is of huge concern to archaeologists and huge concern to all of us as human beings. And that is what happened to the people of Pompeii in those very last moments of life. And archaeologists have been able to reconstruct exactly what happened to, uh, or not exactly, but as close as is possible in this day, you know, in, in the time from which Pompeii was excavated to now, to reconstruct again what happened to these these human beings at the time of the eruption of Vesuvius. <coughs> They've been able to again to reconstruct a very moving picture of their last moments of life. What we know is that the uh, ash and lava from Vesuvius, and you see a, a a restored view here of what that would have been would have looked like. And you can see Vesuvius, uh, and you can see the Forum over here with the Temple of Jupiter and the Temple of Apollo and the throngs of people uh, inside the Forum at this particular juncture as they look up and see what is happening. And on the right-hand side, this is actually a view of Mount St. Helens, which, as you know, erupted in 1980. And the eruption's not so different as you, can, uh, as you gaze upon them and look at them in comparison today. But we know that the, that the eruption of Vesuvius did not happen all at once. It didn't just happen and cover the city. It was gradual. There was actually quite a bit of time. There was time to escape. The, the Pompeians saw what was happening. And those who were smart did escape. But like any other natural disaster, there were, of course, a group of hardy souls, or perhaps we would call them foolhardy souls, who thought that they could ride it out. And they thought they could ride it out by hiding in their own houses or by some of the smarter ones of the foolhardy type uh, <coughs> decided that they could ride it out <coughs> in some of the very strong walled buildings, <coughs> public buildings of the city. For example, the bath buildings, the Stavian baths or the forum baths that we looked at today. They were gravely mistaken, gravely mistaken. We don't know how many stayed. We think it was actually a fairly small number. Some have said about 1,000. We don't know. 
Uh, but wh whatever, th those who did stay had made a grave error because they were not actually killed by the ash and lava, the molten ash and lava, despite the fact that it was extremely hot. But what killed them was the noxious gases that came into the city after the eruption that followed that ash and lava. They were asphyxiated by those gases. <coughs> before, you know, after they had died, but before their bodies decomposed, the ash and lava formed a protective shell around their bodies, uh, protecting them. And what the archaeologists were clever enough to do is when the modern archaeologists, when they were working with their pickaxes, and when that pickaxe hit a hollow in the, uh, in the ash and lava, they poured plaster into that hollow. Sometimes that produced nothing, but sometimes it produced bodies, the actual shape of the bodies of those whose bodies had decomposed there. And we can look at those bodies still today. And I show you a scene of a number of the victims of Pompeii huddled together for mutual and indeed ultimately futile protection. I can show you the body of an individual who is lying on the ground, his face and his hands, trying to protect himself obviously from those noxious gases that have come into the city. I can show you the, uh, the body of the, the plaster cast, obviously, of the body of another Pompeian who was sitting with his knees up and his hands in front of his face trying to protect himself once again from those fumes that are about to overtake him any second. The body of an individual who's essentially given up at this point. He is expired. He's lying on his back. There's no hope any longer for him, uh, a, a poor fellow who died on that day. And then this, this fellow, this heroic fellow, who is lifting himself in his last moment of life, lifting himself either to gasp a last breath or perhaps to whisper something to an endeared, to a, an endeared a family member who is by his side. <coughs> and we even have uh, the body of a dog. This story is particularly sad because this dog, this plaster cast of this dog, was found with a chain around his neck. So probably what happened here is the owner of this particular dog had the dog chained up didn't have time either to take the dog or to release the dog from his chain so that he could try himself to escape. Uh, and that poor dog perished on that day. And we have the plaster cast of his body still today. All of these bodies can still be seen on the site of Pompeii and make a visit there all the more poignant. I know of no more moving human document from the ancient world than these bodies of these Pompeians uh, kept in perpetuity and for us to commiserate with and to understand uh, even today. Thank you.